I think it's in a few different ways you can tackle it. Uh, one is by teaching it, and the other is by living it. And then the, the third option is kind of combine the two by teaching and living. And I think each one of us has different gifts where some are really great teachers, some are really great at leading, and uh, some have that gift to do both of it all the time. Well, I suppose it would have to do uh, with making all of the uh, spiritual decisions in the house. So if like <clears throat> there's just some Sunday when my wife is like, the kids are being crazy, I don't know if we can make it to church, and I I would say like, no, it's this is something we need to do as a family, uh, and I'm I'm overruling your feelings. <laughs> I'm just kidding. That's a that's an example. I'm at church anyway because I'm on staff here. But uh, you being the leader, you have to make all of the decisions for uh, that specific topic. So whether it's whether you guys split your ideas on finances or or discipline or whatever, when it comes to spiritual matters, you need to make all the decisions. I think uh, being a, a spiritual leader. Uh, really just means being consistent, uh, being consistent and following the Lord, um, consistently showing your family what it means to be a part of a local church, plugged in, attending. I think it also means being consistent and reading the Word. And I think uh, the hardest part of being consistent is being consistent in asking for forgiveness when we screw up. Um, men don't like to do that. And that's hard to do, right? So uh, I think what we need to do is be the first one in the home to own up to it, ask for forgiveness from our kids and from our wife and and from the Lord, too, in front of our family. And I think by doing that and being consistent um, to offer forgiveness and also ask for forgiveness is really important. Yeah, I think uh, when I look at, uh, you know, the cliche answer would be, you know, the physical support, grace, encouragement, but I... I thought of two words that I really want to just, I think, focus in on. I think um, sacrificial and initiative. And if for a guy who, you know, my wife would tell you that this guy never stops. Um, he's, he's like the energizer bunny. But it's a little bit different when you're leading your family. And uh, a lot of times um, when you're taking, when you're, when you're loving your family the way that Christ loved the church, it's, it's being sacrificial with your time, with your hobbies, um, you know, being real intentional about some of those things. But I also think, um, like in my line of work, assessment is, is, is big. And so when, when, I, when I ask a lot of, I ask a lot of clarifying questions, like, hey, if it's about investment or if it's about uh, discipline or if it's about our leisure time, asking the question first, right, and then making sure that we clarify. And then I take the initiative to make sure that I um, go ahead and, and do those things uh, in action. Um, and also that works in a good way and then also works in a, in a negative way too. Like, hey, what, what, am, I, am I doing the right things? And, and maybe, you know, asking those questions uh, and saying, hey, what areas can I grow? But I think those two areas of the, the sacrificial and the initiative is, uh, of course, I don't do it perfect, but I think making sure that it's, it's, it's on my shoulders to make sure that I, that I take the lead in my family to, to do what God's called me to do. I think the biggest thing for me is living it out, living my faith out. And that would be by just in this crisis we're in right now with, with uh, uh, just living and being true and trying to reach out to others in a time of need. Um, we do, uh, Katina does a great job at devotions in the morning now. Uh, it's tough for, for us to do it, and she's running with that, and I uh, thank her a lot for that. Um, but having scripture intermixed and just kind of having some time to talk as well as a family. Well, my kids are pretty young. Uh, the most we do right now is we make sure we read Bible studies or Bible stories before uh, they go to bed, um, even though those little books aren't always the most accurate or detailed as I would like to be. Uh, or as I would like them to be. Uh, I mean, David doesn't cut off Goliath's head in those stories, so 
Uh, but other than that, I mean, we make sure we pray all the time. My son, Michael, likes to pray by himself, which is great. So we encourage that kind of stuff. But there's not a lot of uh, in-depth devotions or anything because they're, they're all so little. So one thing, one thing that we do is we read the Bible every night. And as the kids have aged, uh, Kennedy's four now and, and Eli is almost eight, um, we started to use Bibles that we use them that uh, Bibles that are age appropriate. And so early on, it was a very simple Bible with very light, easy stories to understand and almost more entertaining. But over time, it's gotten a little bit more meaty. And for my son, especially, he's doing uh, devotions out of what I would consider to be a regular Bible. And we read together every night. And I think he's progressed to the point now where he's able to understand the story a little bit on his own, but kind of explaining the purpose of the story or the, the point behind the story with him is really important at the end. And um, also teaching him how to pray that, like if the story happens to be about forgiveness, you know, turn that into a prayer after the story. Or if it happens to be about um, uh, being nice to others, then you pray that into the story afterwards in an effort to kind of cement home the purpose of the story too. So. I think this is one of the areas where, where my kids really enjoy this time. They know that uh, at night is when we typically do our family devotions. And um, as they were younger, um, you know, and they have their own Bibles now and getting them into God's Word, and we do a devotion together as a family. Uh, they take turns reading uh, God's Word. Um, we talk a little bit about there's some great resources that are online that actually give you practical stories uh, of different things. Um, so... That has been helpful to be able to kind of share uh, different examples of, of, of making God's Word a little bit more understandable. Um, we try to do, um, you know, Scripture verses on like a dry erase board, uh, like the Scripture verse of the week, to just to try to let that kind of soak in. Um, when they were going to school, uh, I would put Scripture verses in their lunchbox, um, so just something that they would be able to kind of uh, look at. I think a lot of times in media or on TV, we might pause a movie or something like that or pause something and tell them, okay, this is not what in God's Word, like I think about a story about David or Samson. This is not how it actually is in, in God's Word. So let's go to it. Let's, let's look at the story and then talk about that. Or one of my favorite things to do is, even though I have a lot of people in my family that are musical, um, I'm the non-musical person, um, but when we're, when we're listening to, to Christian music, we will talk about where does this come from? So like I think about the song about, you know, if God is for us, who can be, you know, those type of songs. And we're like, well, where is that? Well, that's Romans 8. And so we talk about some of those things. And, and um, so it just helps to kind of portray that into uh, where we're finding God's truth and to be able to know God's truth so that when they see something that's contrary, they know that for themselves because they have seen um, that for themselves. Well, I got three daughters, so that's uh, challenging at times as well, um, but they're all great. I think a lot of it is uh, my wife is awesome, and she's helped me come along, and just realizing that you can't be the same for each age group, and as they change, as they are in their five-year-olds, you have to attack it one way when they're at 10 and 15, so you got to be adapt because what you did at one stage will backfire at you at another stage, and just being open to to that part of it, I will say I'm a little farther behind in in that part of it, and that's where I catch up and I find myself having to talk differently to like to Kaylee than compared to Bree and and then Chloe. So it's just being adapt to as they grow and change that you have to grow and change how you attack it as well. I'd say for me it's twofold. Uh, one is I get frustrated when my kids aren't as smart as I think they should be. I mean, they're immature five- and two-year-olds, but uh, so I, I kind of get frustrated when they don't understand what I'm saying. Uh, and the best way I can navigate through that is uh, just remembering who I'm talking to. I'm talking to a five-year-old. I don't talk to other kid, people's five-year-olds like that because they, I, I recognize that they're young and I feel like my kids should know better. Uh, but they don't because they're so young. Um, 
putting away my own selfish desires. Um, I like to play game, like video games. I like to watch TV. Uh, I like to, there's a lot of things I like. And uh, when you're a parent and your kids are awake, you can't be doing that stuff all the time. You got to, you know, make sure you're playing with the kids, make sure they're doing their work, schoolwork or whatever, you know, you got to put them first. And uh, me as a human being, me as a, as a guy, that's, that's a naturally hard thing to do is to put yourself last. You mentioned busyness. I think busyness is, is, a, is a challenge for all dads today, especially because we're in a culture where we're never disconnected. We're, we're connected to work usually through our smartphone at all times. And that's a challenge for me. I, I do try to make efforts to you know, put it on silent or do not disturb or leave it in another room or just leave it at home when they leave. Um, for me, if I'm, if I'm sitting at home with my kids, I struggle not to look at my phone and be busy. Uh, that's a challenge for me. So um, I try to be intentional about saying, hey, let's get up, let's get out of the house, do something outside if it's not nice out, let's get in the car and just go. And in that way, I can focus more on not just my kids, but my wife too, um, and kind of remove that distraction. I think the other challenge is, um, I think the culture has made fatherhood into something totally different than what it's supposed to be. Um, I don't like the idea that dads are supposed to be wimpy and um, you know, take, take direction at all times from their spouse. I think um, the challenge in today's culture is being a leader in the home, but also um, showing grace uh, to the family too. So um, being a, a biblical leader is really a challenge in today's culture, but I think we need to stand up for that because that's important. Um. I have this uh, shirt that's in, I should have worn this today. I have this shirt that says, Best Dad Ever. And uh, it's an Iowa Hawkeye thing. And uh, the, the girls have now said it's the best dud, best dud ever. And uh, I think part of that is, uh, you know, now they tell me that the challenging part is, Dad, you're getting more gray hairs now. And, um, but I think when I was younger, I think in my, in my walk or uh, younger in my fatherhood, I would say yes to everything. And I think... You know, I'm a, I'm a type A personality, so uh, planning is is huge for me. Whether it's it's in work, it's it's in ministry, it's in uh, the family life. But as I've gotten older, I'm really starting to say no a lot more, and not because I'm a big negative Nancy or whatever the case may be. But when you say yes to something that means that you're saying no to something else. And so you've got to be very intentional with your time about the time that God has given to you on this earth and to be able to, to make sure that you're using that time for his glory. And so, so the girls know that like in the month of May, for example, is graduation uh, month. So they know that that's kind of a busy month for me. But I'm very, as they've gotten older, I can communicate with them and say, hey, daddy's got a very busy couple days, but at the end of the week or whatever, it's go time as a family. We're spending that time together. So that's important for me. And I think other, other challenges, I think sometimes as a spiritual leader, I sometimes feel like maybe you're on all the time, right? Like you're you're in the spotlight, and, and sometimes when you make a mistake or things that that don't go that doesn't go as well as you would desire, um, I think it's important for our kids to understand that we're not perfect. We serve a perfect heavenly Father, but we ourselves are not perfect. And so, being authentic with them, being real with your challenges or your struggles about what you struggle with, and showing them that hey, I don't have it all together, but I've got a God that I serve that. Uh, mends all those things together, and I think that's how I could try to navigate my time and, and try to to show them that I'm your earthly father, but you serve a heavenly father who is 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 way more amazing than than who I am. So. Biggest thing is be consistent is what I'd have to say. And that's a mistake I had because I wasn't consistent all the time. And uh, that came back and backfired because you always have that one, uh, one daughter saying, well, why are you doing that with her, but you did it different with me? So that's the biggest thing is just be consistent with your approach. But also realize that if you made a mistake, go back and talk to them and say, Hey, I, I did it the wrong way. You know, please forgive me. And and this is what we're doing differently. Then. Well, I guess the first thing I would say is that uh, all kids are different. So your uh, 
your form of discipline might not be the same for your oldest or your middle or your youngest or however many kids you have. Um, I personally haven't had to spank any kid. Uh, not that I'm against it. I just haven't had to. There's not been anything in my mind that's been uh, done that's needing of that. Um, a lot of things I made mistakes on is I jump to conclusions too quickly or my own anger gets in the way. Like I need to calm down before I discipline my kid. Um, so I guess my advice would be to, to make sure you get all the facts, make sure you know what the actual situation is. If you're fired up, you need to calm down before you discipline and uh, also follow through with something. If you say you're going to you're going to lose your toys if you do this, and then they do it again, and you don't take away their toys. It's basically worth nothing. So you got to make sure you follow through with what you're gonna say or what you say. Yeah, I've been I've been thinking about I've been thinking about discipline after reading the the questions that you sent, um, Tony. And I feel like I feel like there's two main things I want to say about discipline. One, discipline is challenging for parents because they often over discipline or under discipline. And I've definitely done that as a father myself. Um, but I think the punishment has to match the crime. And so um, my advice to young dads and, and really a reminder for myself is that if you over-discipline, you're teaching your kids that you're brutal. And by extension, if you're trying to teach them about the Lord and his authority, you might be teaching them that he's brutal too, and he's not. Uh, and if you under-discipline, then you become a pushover, and rules don't really apply then. And, and children can run rampant and do whatever they want. And then uh, by extension, they learn that about you, and they might learn that about God, that uh, living under authority and following a set of rules is not important. And so I think we have to discipline appropriately. And then secondly, I think there has to be discipline. Too many parents, I, I see this all the time with um, in, in the culture, I was a lifeguard for many years, and I'll never forget sitting on that lifeguard stand and hearing over and over again all summer long parents saying, if you don't listen, the lifeguard's going to discipline you, or the lifeguard's going to get you in trouble. Parents should be the ones who discipline, not other authority. Don't threaten your kids with a teacher disciplining you or the principal. Don't threaten your kids with the other authority around disciplining you, aunts, uncles, cousins, grandparents. Parents need to step up to do the discipline, and empty threats don't work. I cannot, I cannot say how much, how much frustration I have when I hear people say, if you don't do this, then we're going to leave this really important party or wedding or 50th wedding anniversary party. That's not realistic. You're not going to leave. That's an important event. Or uh, we're not going to give you any Christmas presents. That's not realistic. I think that the threat has to be realistic and the punishment has to be realistic. And so empty threats are, um, are something that we can't do as parents. We have to follow through. I think what I've learned about discipline is is really taking your child and and um, bringing them into away from everything, going into their bedroom or going into a, a quiet place where it's just the one on one aspect. When you look at uh, shepherding a child's heart, you really start to uh, you know the action just took place, right? And we can't we're not going to fix that or, or those type of things. But if you really go back into what the kid. Uh, what your child is is feeling, or or what they're they're processing through that thing, and really get to the heart of the matter. Uh, I've learned that you know you've learned a lot about your kids in that aspect. And I think about um, I grew up in a house full of guys, and so there's it's way different growing up with uh, you know uh, in a in a house full of women. So uh, my tone of voice is, is super important. Like if I'm in the flesh, and I am not spirit led. Uh, I've done some things in anger that definitely would would not be the way that I would do that. And I've learned over the years to make sure that my tone of voice is is, is the right tone. And I think it's important for also for our kids uh, as we go through, after we're done with the discipline process, to make sure that they we pray. We pray together. So I let them pray first and then I finish because it's modeling that aspect of, of repentance and confession before a holy God. And then when they see that, they understand that, okay, I, you know, I, I messed up, but I still love them. I will, no matter what they do, I will always love them the way that our Heavenly Father loves, loves us. So I think it's also important as, as a father or as a parent to be consistent, right? So if you, if you take this one thing that they, the kid does and you blow up and you don't do anything else the rest of the week or whatever, you, you got to be consistent in that discipline process, and it starts young. And, and if you read Proverbs, you understand that if you train a child up in the way that they should go, they'll never depart from some of those things. 
Um, it's also interesting is that each of, your, each of the children are, are wired very differently. Um, the one child I would just give a look at, and that look, I, I'm not a scary guy, I may look scary, but that look would just, that would send her, her sprawling. And the other kid would tell me, Daddy, that discipline didn't do anything for me. What else do you got? And so <laughs> you look at some of those things and you say, all right, Lord, you've definitely wired each of us very differently. And so um, I think that's very important, just the process of just keeping being consistent, that prayer and confession aspect, and then just modeling that, that aspect of being, and then showing them in God's word. There's never a sin that's ever going to be something that we will ever do that has not been done before in human life. So you look at the Old Testament, you look at the New Testament, and you share them those stories of how Jesus interacted or how the Lord in the Old Testament really started to kind of show some of these behaviors of whether it was idolatry or some of those other things, how did, how did God's word or how did God handle some of those things and you show them some of those things, we're not different and we'll never be anything different from that. But there's a model of a way to be able to continue to um, show that humbleness and that gentleness and that expression of confession before, before God. We're different. I don't know what else to say on that. Uh, we're just different with, in general, on how we think. We're more of a problem solver, and we need to step back and try to listen. So when you hear your husband saying, try to come up with a fix, just ask him kindly, hey, can you hear me out on what I'm saying? And Because in general, women need to talk more and more emotional and let it go through. And guys are like, okay, I'm going to go solve it right away. And there's times where we just need to step back and keep our mouth quiet and listen, listen, and hear what they're saying, and and uh, and be part of the conversation. Hmm. I guess I got another two-parter on this one. One is um, just because your husband or whoever uh, doesn't act the same way you do, or doesn't discipline or react the same way you do doesn't mean it's wrong. I might be dipping into what my own marriage is like, but I, I do sing things a lot differently than my wife, and sometimes she thinks I'm doing it wrong. That's not necessarily the case. A lot of the times it is, but not always. So if, you know, dads or husbands do something a little differently, that doesn't mean it's incorrect. Uh, also, wives, don't expect your husband to know what you're thinking uh, when it comes to everything. We usually mean well, but we always don't know exactly what you want. So sometimes you just got to tell us. I, I think I have two things. One, uh, one thing I think women need to understand is that men, they probably know that men aren't super emotional. We don't always show the lovey-dovey side and um, that sweet side or that romantic side. So the first thing I, I guess I would say is that we show our love to other people in practical ways generally. Know that you are loved by your spouse, that your kids are loved by their dad, even though they might not say that. Um, yes, we need to improve. I need to improve on saying that more often, um, actually verbalizing it and showing it affectionately physically maybe. But um, I think it's important for women to understand that men, just, that's not natural necessarily for men and, and that Fathers and husbands do love their wives and their kids very much, even though they don't always say it. And the second thing is, um, I think women should know that in the same way that we're not overly emotional, we might not always show it, but it, we care very much for what they think. Um, we might not care what other people think. I don't really care what strangers think of me, but we care very much for what our wives think of us and our children think of us. And so... Um, our wives need to be aware of how they talk about us in public and in front of other people. That's really important. I'm glad that my wife doesn't throw me under the bus often, but when I hear wives throwing their husbands under the bus, um, I know that that cuts to the heart of the man, even though he might not show it. And so uh, I'm thankful for my wife that she supports me and she never does that to me, but um, I think other women need to recognize that too. Uh, that, that needs to stop. It's common in our culture and it needs to stop. Tony, I think this is a trick question. Um, I, I don't think uh, <laughs> they they certainly know us a lot more than than we know them, and so I th so uh, this is this is a tough question. But I, I guess what I would say is is when you bring uh, 
your spouse, again, don't do this during a Cubs game or a Bears game. Do this in the quietness of the things that are not going on. And, and I know during this time that we have a lot more quietness, but do that in private. So if there's something that, that we've done, whether it's a project around the house or maybe it's something about leading the family, encourage, encourage them as best you can. Say, hey, honey, I really appreciate the way that you did this or you led the family in this. Those words can be huge in terms of respect and encouraging the heart from a male standpoint. You may think that we on the outside are rough and gruff in some of those things, but when you speak to a man's heart, sometimes we forget about some of those things, right? And we forget about in the busyness of things that the first thing that we see is, is the outside. But speak to the inside, and that's going to go a long way. Um, so, and, and, and that could also be on the flip side, like, hey, there, <laughs> there's some things that I haven't done really well. <laughs> so, hey, next time, let's get somebody that knows a little bit more about this around the house, or let's, uh, <laughs> let's, uh, let's do this in a different way in terms of leading, or from a discipline aspect, like, hey, you didn't handle that the best. If you can do that, that is at least, I think men really respond really well to that in terms of that encouraging aspect. And, and then just those small tokens of appreciation right to here. That's a good question. I would say faith in Jesus, but then also action. Uh, that I wasn't just book smart and I just went and learned about it, that I learned about it and also I served and helped other people out. Uh, that's probably the would be really nice to hear down the road is that my dad was not only faithful, but he also served and he lived what he said. This question was a little tough for me. Um, I mean, we all want to be remembered for something. It's just kind of how we are as humans. Uh, we always want to have our stamp of something on this earth, whether it's through something on the internet or something in history or through our kids or whatever. Um, and I'm not any different. Uh, I guess what I would like to be remembered, we all want to be remembered for something, whether it's, oh, I'm a good, I was a good dad or I was a good husband. But if my kids were to remember me for anything, I would want to be remembered as someone who, like, my dad loved Jesus, or at my funeral, if my kid only said, now here was a godly man, that's all I would want. Um, spiritual legacy is something that's hard to think about when you're young, and so I think about other men who might be in their 20s and 30s as parents, and that might not be the first thing on our mind. We're just trying to get through the day. We got young kids that are very needy, and um, we got a lot of things going on, whether it's financially or in our uh, careers, trying to establish our careers or get our finances in order. And so I don't think spiritual legacy is something we think about, but the seeds that we plant now with our children will last. And what we say now, in, in the same way that I think about the great things that my parents taught me when they were young, our parents are going to be thinking about the things that we teach them when we're young too, uh, in our 30s and, and even in our 20s. And so we need to be thinking about spiritual discipline. That's why the question's good. And secondly, I think this... Or we, we need to be thinking about um, uh, spiritual legacy, and I think that's why it's a good question. But the spiritual legacy that I want to leave is that, um, that Jesus is the most important thing in my life. And I want my kids to know that they're extremely important to me and that my wife is extremely important to me and that I was a hard worker, but I want them to recognize that Jesus was number one. And for them uh, in their life, they have to choose that too. Um, I, I hope that they choose that because they saw that lived out in their mother's life and in their father's life as well. Um, something I want them to remember me by, I try to tell my kids often that they bring me joy. And I want them to also um, experience in that, life, th that in their life too. Uh, I love them, but, and I tell them that, but I want them to also know that they bring me a lot of joy and happiness because they're a great gift that the Lord has given me. And I hope that one day they can pass that along to their kids too. So I come from a, a long line of, of guys or family members who were, were great people. They were great people because they were compassionate or nice. And I guess the two words that I would, that I would want to, to them to understand, I guess, would be authentic and then disciple. And, and for them to know that, that when you put Jesus first place in all things, there's nothing in this earth that is going to stop that. And I look at grandchildren or children after me or family members after me, I want them to know that I, was, that I love Jesus with all my heart, with all my soul, with all my mind, 
and that I loved others and, and that I was authentic with those conversations. Um, and so everything else in this life, that this life was not about me, that this life was truly about Jesus. And if I knew that when I was younger as a kid, um, this life could have been a lot different, but I want them to know that. I want them to know that, um, that there's nothing um, that I, I love the Lord and I can't wait to be with him, but I want other people to, the other people in my family to be able to be the disciples that God has called them to be, to share God's word and to do that in amazing ways.